This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Hey guys, I recently learned that the number zero was forbidden for 1500 years. At first I was like, what? How could a number be forbidden? And then I was like, why would a number be forbidden? Also, hasn't zero just always been around? We're so familiar with it today. But it turns out there was a time when the concept of zero didn't exist. Humans had to invent it. And when we did, it caused a lot of drama. How could a number that literally means nothing cause so much controversy? This is the story of Zero's rise from rags to riches, or you could say, from zero to hero. The time before Zero was before the beginning of recorded history, so paleontologists have had to piece together the birth of mathematics from bits of stone and bone. They discovered that many ancient civilizations independently came up with counting in the form of tallying, lines drawn in the earth or carved into animal bones. But none of these civilizations had a symbol for zero. The concept didn't exist. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. Stone Age mathematics stemmed from a need to keep track of things. Now, we don't know exactly what early humans were keeping track of. Maybe how many rocks they'd collected or how many children they'd had. But we do know they were keeping track of something. They didn't need to keep track of zero rocks or zero children. You either had children or you didn't. For the average Stone Age human, the concept of zero was unnecessary, so nobody thought to invent a symbol for it. It also requires the idea that the absence of something is a thing in itself, which was a pretty advanced idea for our caveman ancestors. But if not in the Stone Age, when did humans invent zero? Fast forward about 2000 years to the Bronze Age, it was in the flourishing state of Babylon, or modern-day Iraq, that zero first entered the world. But it was slightly different than how we use it today. To see why, we need to understand the Babylonian counting system. The Babylonians only used two symbols to represent numbers. This wedge-looking thing, which represented a 1, and this arrow-looking thing, which represented a 10. To write different numbers, they would just combine these two symbols. 2 was just two 1 symbols together, 20 was just two 10 symbols together, and 17 was one 10 symbol and seven 1 symbols. They used a sexagesimal system, meaning rather than using base 10 like we do today, they used base 60. Once they got to 59, they just used the same symbol as 1 to represent 60. They used positional notation as well, meaning the position of each symbol had its own specific meaning. We also use positional notation. When we write the number 111, we know the value of what each different one means because of its position. There's a one in the ones column, a one in the tens column, and a one in the hundreds column. Adding them together gives 111. Rather than multiples of 10, the Babylonians used multiples of 60. So this number would be 3,600 plus 60 plus one. 3,661. There was a problem though. Imagine we have the number 3,601. So a one in the 3,600s column, nothing in the 60 column, and a one in the ones column. This is fine if we always have columns to guide us, but when it came to writing down numbers, the Babylonians just wrote freehand on clay tablets. This made it very difficult to tell numbers apart. Was this 3,601, 3,660, or 61? Imagine writing 101 like this, 110 like this, and 11 like this. That's basically what the Babylonians were working with. And just like we use a zero to distinguish between numbers, so too did they. By around 300 BC, the Babylonians invented this symbol to represent the empty column. It stood as a placeholder, which made it easy to tell the difference between numbers. Zero was born into the world, but it wasn't quite like we use it today. It was just a symbol that meant there is nothing there. It wasn't a number, it had no place on the number line and it wasn't used in any mathematical operations like addition or subtraction. It wasn't that the Babylonians never thought of making zero into a number, but rather it confused them. See, zero doesn't behave like other numbers. Add any number to any other number and it gets bigger. 
Subtract a number from any other number and it gets smaller, but not zero. Zero never makes any number bigger or smaller. Furthermore, the number line can be viewed as a rubber band and multiplication as stretching the rubber band. Multiplying by two stretches the rubber band by a factor of two. Multiplying by three stretches the rubber band by a factor of three. But when you multiply by zero, you get zero. There's no stretch, the rubber band vanishes into thin air. And don't even get me started with what happens when you divide by zero. We still don't know how to handle that situation, so imagine how scary it would have been for the Babylonians. No, they weren't ready for zero as a number. Still, it had a place in the world, but not for long. This is my favorite part of the story because it's so dramatic. The ancient Greeks heard about zero from the Babylonians and they hated it. Not only did they reject it as a number, they didn't like it as a placeholder and avoided it wherever they could. They didn't even have a name or symbol for it. How could anyone feel so strongly about a number? Well, it all started with a guy named Pythagoras. You might remember him from such theorems as Pythagoras' theorem, but back in ancient Greece, he was a charismatic scholar and teacher. He was also pretty eccentric. He was convinced he was the reincarnated soul of the Trojan hero Euphorbus, and that all souls transmigrated to other bodies after death, including animals, which was why he was vegetarian. Beans, though, were taboo, as he thought they were like genitalia. Anyway, he developed a cult-like following around mathematics. His teachings revolved around the idea that reality is mathematical in nature. He believed that there was no distinction between shapes and numbers, and a number couldn't exist without a shape. The number 16 was a square number, as it could be arranged into four rows of four. The number 10 was a triangular number, as it could be arranged into, well, a triangle. They derived relationships between numbers in a geometric way. For example, square numbers can be divided up into two triangular numbers. Zero didn't really fit with this view. After all, what shape could zero be? It's easy to think of a square with width and height of three or a line of length five, but was a square with a width and height of zero still a square? Was a line of zero length still a line? To treat zero as a number, the Greeks would have to revamp their entire way of doing mathematics. And well, they didn't want to. But there was an even deeper reason the Greeks rejected zero. They were very mystical people and thought that math, the universe and God were all intertwined. Numbers represented concepts like earth, fire and water, justice, reason and family. Zero was associated with non-existence, oblivion and the denial of God. According to the Aristotelian doctrine, there was no void and to contemplate zero was to question the existence of God. This doctrine dominated the West and zero was forbidden for over 1500 years. Now the ancient Greeks did a lot of great things, but their rejection of zero was probably one of their biggest blunders. It's thought to be the only thing which stopped them from discovering calculus. To show you how, let me tell you about a paradox you might have heard of before. Zeno's paradox, where the athlete Achilles challenges the tortoise to a race. Achilles is faster than the tortoise. He runs at one meter per second, while the tortoise runs at half a meter per second. To make it fair, Achilles gives the tortoise a one meter head start. At what point will Achilles pass the tortoise? To overtake the tortoise, Achilles first needs to catch up to the place where the tortoise was. At one second, Achilles is at the one meter mark, but by this time, the tortoise has moved ahead by half a meter. At one and a half seconds, Achilles is at the one and a half meter mark. But by this time, the tortoise has moved ahead by a quarter of a meter. At one and three quarters of a second, Achilles is at the one and three quarters mark, but the tortoise has moved ahead by an eighth of a meter. Logically, this would continue indefinitely. Zeno argued that because the distance can be divided an infinite number of times, Achilles has an infinite number of distances to travel to overtake the tortoise. Therefore, he never will. Now, Zeno didn't believe this is what would actually happen in the real world. It was an argument based purely on logic. But the ancient Greeks couldn't find the flaw in his argument, and Zeno's paradox went unsolved for over two millennia. As we'll see, we would need to wait for Zero to solve it. While Zero was an outcast in the West, it was welcomed with open arms in the East. 
Like the Greeks, the Indians had learnt about zero from the Babylonians, but unlike the Greeks, they didn't have this geometric philosophy or fear of nothingness. In fact, the idea of the void was at the core of the Hindu religion. Emptiness was associated with spiritual peace and creative potential. Indian mathematicians embraced the idea of zero and were the first in recorded history to transform it from a placeholder into its very own number. The exact details of how and when this happened are lost to time, but their quick acceptance of zero was probably due to how they viewed mathematics. They saw numbers as separate from the physical world, entities to be manipulated without any physical meaning. This meant numbers didn't have to make geometric sense. You can't remove four acres of land from a two acre plot as negative area doesn't make sense, but you can subtract four from two to get negative two. This led to the idea of negative numbers and the foundations of modern day algebra. The ancient Indians were content to have zero in their number system since it fit perfectly between the positives and negatives. Now, zero had a place on the number line. Zero as we know it today had arrived. After a bumpy start to life, Zero would have the last laugh. Over time, Zero spread to Africa, where an Italian mathematician named Fibonacci was studying. You might know his name from the Fibonacci sequence, but it turns out he also introduced both Zero and Arabic numerals to Europe. Italian tradesmen couldn't resist how easy they made calculations. Despite the church still insisting that Zero was satanic, its usefulness was irresistible and Zero spread throughout the West. Finally, 1500 years after its banishment, the West had accepted zero as a number. And it's a good thing they did, because it forms the core of a lot of modern day mathematics. Let's go back to Zeno's paradox. It's true that the distance Achilles must cover to overtake the tortoise can be divided an infinite number of times, but that doesn't mean he must travel an infinite distance. I'm sure you've noticed that the distances he must travel get smaller and smaller. Today we would say that the terms are approaching zero. We can see that as the terms approach zero, the sum approaches two. This is called a limit. The sum will never go beyond two, it's heading straight there. As the terms approach zero, the limit of the sum is two. So Achilles will overtake the tortoise at the two meter mark. The limit is the backbone of calculus. It's the reason we can land rockets on the moon and build the world's tallest skyscrapers. The Greeks couldn't solve Zeno's paradox because they didn't have zero, so they couldn't really let the distance approach zero. If they had, they would most likely have discovered calculus. I've made a video called Three Paradoxes That Gave Us Calculus if you'd like to know more about limits and the two other key ideas that make up calculus. We've come a long way since the days that zero was feared and rejected. Today, zero has countless uses. It's thanks to calculus that we can analyze the progression of cancer, set the minimum amount for credit card payments, and predict the orbit of the planets. The computer or phone you're watching this video on runs on strings of zeros and ones. Without zero, there would be no computers, no social media, and no online games. Modern day geometry and navigation rely on the idea of zero. So next time you're in this situation, just think, maybe zero isn't so bad after all. You know what I find most fascinating about this story is just how much your beliefs can influence everything. Like the ancient Greeks and Indians had different beliefs about what the void meant, which influenced their mathematics, which influenced what they could and couldn't do with their mathematics. Also the fact that different cultures invented different ways of doing mathematics, but ultimately in the end, all the same ideas ended up bubbling to the surface. It raises the question, is math invented or discovered? If the ancient Indians hadn't made zero into a number, would someone else have? Did they really invent zero or did they discover it? This question fascinated me so much, I made a feature documentary about it on Nebula. What's Nebula? Some creative friends and I teamed up with our own streaming platform where we don't have to worry about the pressure of the YouTube algorithm or clickbait titles to keep creating. It's called Nebula and we're partnering with our friends at CuriosityStream. Nebula is a place where we can focus on passion projects, experiment with original content, all while staying completely ad-free. Nebula features a lot of YouTube's top educational creators like Real Engineering, Joe Scott, Isaac Arthur, Medlife Crisis, and many more. If you're a deep thinker and like to contemplate the boundary between math and philosophy, I think you'll like my documentary.
there are entire series of exclusive content on there as well, like Real Science's amazing new documentary series about the key moments in our human evolution. So what does all of this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, CuriosityStream make award-winning documentaries ranging from science to history to nature, so they obviously value education. They want to support the creation of more educational content. So we've worked out a deal where if you sign up with CuriosityStream using the link below, you get Nebula completely free, a two for one deal. For a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's less than $15 a year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. I loved this four-part documentary series on CuriosityStream called The Story of Maths, which goes way more in depth about the development of mathematics throughout the ages. If you liked today's video, you will love this documentary. If you'd like to support the channel and the entire educational community, sign up to CuriosityStream and Nebula with the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash up and Thank you so much for watching and supporting education. Bye.